Okay, there you go. Cool. Uh, welcome to Python Lecture 4. Uh, so this is the fourth lecture in our series, and today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some a bit more advanced uh, data structures and features of Python, and we'll finish with, with plotting, which is especially useful for, for the science guys. Uh, if, if any of you have questions, please stop the, type them on the chat or just shout out. Uh, interruption is expected. And uh, yeah, let's let's begin. If any of you took part in the in the previous uh, lectures, if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to email me or 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 put them in the on the chat now uh, when it comes to the material from the pre previous exercises. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about tuples. So you might heard you might have heard of lists. Uh, which we have done last week and two weeks ago. So uh, our collections of things which have a particular order. As, and as you might remember, we could uh, modify those lists. So we could define a list one, two, three, four, five, and then we could change uh, which values are at the particular indices. Uh, Python also offers constant lists, which are called tuples, and tuples can't be modified. Uh, we say that they are immut immutable, which means that they cannot be modified, and they are much faster than than the lists because we don't really have to keep track track of those modifications, and we don't have to uh, have all these additional di data to 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 provide the modifications. Okay, let's go to the workspace. Do you all guys have the workspace? It wasn't the Python event, or it's available on the chat. Uh, if you could please type in the chat that you have the workspace, uh, that would be great. Marias or Nicolas. If you have issues with the workspace, uh, please let me know. Uh, you should open it with Anaconda as we did in the previous lectures. OK, cool. All right, so I'll, I'll start with tuples. So as you can see, tuples are defined by uh, putting a bracket, a regular bracket, and then typing in the, the, the values separated by commas. Pretty similar to the lists, except we have uh, a different type of bracket. And uh, we can access the elements by their indices, but they cannot be modified. So yeah, here I have commented out this line, but uh, this will shout at me if I'll try to modify it. So let's run this cell, remember shift enter, and uh, you see I'm trying to assign value zero to the first index uh, of, the, of the tuple. And, uh, oh, sorry. So you see type error. So tuples do not support item assignment. Uh, there was a mistake in T1 line. I think there is a double comma here. So uh, if you can delete it, uh, then it would work. Uh, all right, so tuples can have different types of objects inside them. So we can have booleans, so true, false, uh, strings or numbers, also floats probably. 0.5, but we can't mutate them. So let's keep it in the comment. Also, tuples can be defined uh, without the bracket. So we can just uh, list the objects we want in, in, in one thing. Uh, and then it will automatically uh, give us a tuple. Uh, personally, personally, I usually define the, uh, the thingies uh, with, uh, with with brackets, so it kind of encapsulates the object. Uh, all right, we can also uh, assign to variables using a tuple. So you see that the t is uh, currently true, high, and 
and three. Now I can assign the values back. OK. I have to have the same number of variables as the length of the tuple. So here the tuple has a uh, has four va variables. Uh, also, tuples can't be modified, but we can assign different objects to the same variable. So as you can see, t is equal to one to three here, and then it's equal to uh, true high three and three and a half. Uh, so these tuples are different tuples. So uh, we don't really have to worry about uh, them, uh, the immutability here. Whereas if we want to modify indices, it might prove tricky. OK, we can assign all those. And uh, let's say we want to print A and C. You can see that that prints uh, true and three, which was the first and the third element of the tuple. OK, cool. Uh, now maybe a simple exercise. Uh, so we want to define a function which will return both maximum and minimum in terms of the lexicographical order of a list consisting of tuples. Uh, so lexicographical order is that we have a list of tuples and the first value is kind of leading value. So if it's greater than the whole element is automatically greater. And if A1 is equal to A2, then uh, we consider the, uh, the inequality between B1 and B2. If uh, B1 and B2 are equal, uh, then we will have equality. Um, so we want to do a simple linear scan of the uh, of the list of tuples. Uh, let me write down the list of tuples which we might want to consider. One, two, uh, three. Let's say nine, nine, five, eight, six, and six, seven. Let's say we want to consider this list of tuples and uh, find the minimum and maximum with, with a function, say, mini, maxi. Uh, and it will take a list of tuples. Let's call it TS. Uh, I'll give you guys a minute to think about it and then I'll code up the solution. Sorry, there is a motorcycle somewhere there. It will disappear. OK. A couple more seconds. Cool. All right. So first thing we'll have to do is to uh, define a variable max and min. Uh, I'll do it with an underscore because if I would do it without, uh, then uh, it would refer to a function in Python. And uh, let's say it will be ts of zero. So it's the first element of the list and the same ts of zero here. Uh, we're assuming that we're given a list which is not non-empty, uh, so we can put it here. Uh, cool. And now we want to just loop through the list of TSs. Um, so we do for, uh, let's say, T in TSs. And now if uh, Actually, we can uh, we can 
straight away uh, use the fact that we have a list of tuples and uh, loop through the through the tuples. So you can call it a pattern matching. So here we know we have a list of tuples. So each element will be uh, will consist of two variables. And uh, now by using this uh, knowledge, we can straight away access those. So uh, now if uh, A is greater than max of uh, zero, uh, or mm, A is equal to max of zero, Okay, we'll put it in a bracket. And uh, B is greater than max of one. Then we want to make uh, max equal to A and B. Remember that we can define it with a bracket or without a bracket. Okay, that's for maximum. Now, if A is, we can do a really similar thing. So copy it out. And now if A is less than a minimum uh, of zero, or they are equal and B is less than a minimum one, then we do min equal to and B. And so this function wants to return multiple values, right? Two tuples. Uh, this can be done by returning a tuple. So we'll return the tuple of min and max. Okay. And now we want to call our function mini maxi. On TSS. Right? I guess we get the, the expected behavior. So minimum is one, two, because one is the lowest first element. Uh, let's add a one, uh, three to see if it still returns the same minimum. Yeah, it does, because they are equal here, but uh, three is greater than two. Uh, and similar thing applies to max. As you can see, tuples are printed in the way that they are defined. OK, that's it for tuples. If you have any questions, please type them on the chat. And we'll come back to the presentation. OK, so uh, after going through the tuples, uh, it's important to touch on the probably one of the most useful data structures in the basic Python, which are the dictionaries. Uh, dictionaries are basically tables which we can access with a key. So uh, if you, let's say, you are searching something in a dictionary, it means that you uh, have a key. And uh, if you supply the key to the dictionary, it will give you the corresponding value. So you can think of it as a as a key value uh, list, sort of. Uh, dictionaries are really fast, so uh, we say that access to their elements is constant time, which means that uh, you can access them always with the same, uh, it always takes the same time to access whichever element you would like to access, but they take up some space in the computer memory. Okay. Let's jump to the workspace. So uh, here we have a rock dictionary. Uh, so let's say it uh, it measures the the thickness or maybe the the how hard is a particular uh, particular rock, and uh, given the name of the rock, we can re we can retrieve its 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 firmness. Uh, printing dictionaries, it's pretty it's pretty intuitive. It just prints the key value first, and uh, also uh, 
And also, if you want to access an element with a key, uh, then we just supply the key and it will give us the value. As you can see, we're accessing the basalt and we're getting number one. Cool. Uh, adding values to dictionaries is basically uh, using the name of the dictionary and then uh, supplying a key, which we want to update, uh, and supplying the value. Uh, in case we would like to, let's say, uh, uh, update the key value pair, uh, then we can, for example, do rocks dictionary and take the granite. Granite, I hope you say it this way. And update its value to let's say 98. And then we can print rocks dictionary to see if it's actually updated. Okay. So uh, accessing values with the key, updating values with the key. Uh, it only remembers the last updated value. Also, maybe in the first cell, I'll just uh, make a small uh, mention that to define an empty dictionary, uh, we just use this curly braces. And this is the definition of the empty dictionary. Great. All right. There is an update function for, for dictionaries, which is just uh, adding a, a key value pair to the dictionary. I personally don't use it that often. I rather just type uh, a key and update the value. Uh, but it's an option. Also, uh, there was one problem with dictionaries. So if you want to, let's say, modify a value that is not defined in the dictionary, let's say we have a, a, a black rock and want to increase its value by one, but we don't have the black rock in the dictionary, it will shout at us because we will receive a key error. So it means that uh, there is no such key in the dictionary. Uh, let's say we we change schist to black rock. And now it should be possible and it will actually update our value. So now black rock, oh. Start from the beginning. Yep. So we have a black rock with value seven. We can we can de delete the the entries in the dictionary. Uh, so let's say I want to delete the black rock entry. Then I just uh, use the del operator from the lists, if you remember. And then I just do that. And there is no longer Blackrock in the in the entry. I see that uh, like four people joined recently or three. So if you have any questions or would you like me to reiterate anything, uh, please type it on the chat. OK, cool. There is no shift. All right. Now, iterating through di dictionaries uh, is a really similar process to iterating through lists. Uh, so it will basically, uh, first of all, we can check if, if a particular key is in the dictionary. Uh, there is a function called keys for dictionaries, uh, which will give us a list of keys yep let's print it yeah and it gives us the the list of keys and when i was uh less experienced with python i would always check whether the particular key is in the list of keys uh, it turns out you don't really have to uh, type this keys function. 
uh, to iterate or to or to see the the keys list. Uh, you can just check whether it's in the rock. It's in the uh, it's in the rocks dict. Uh, you can't check whether the particular value is in the dictionary, but you can check whether a particular key is in the dictionary. So we know that granite is uh, is in the rocks dictionary, so we can print this value. Uh, it's a uh, this check. Uh, this kind of check happens quite often. Uh, well, because we don't want a behavior at which we access a key which is not actually in the dictionary. Uh, let's say we want to print uh, a dummy rock. Uh, rock stick of dummy rock. And it will be just an invalid operation because we'll get an, a key error because we're again trying to access an element that is not actually in the dictionary. Uh, yep. Key error. Cool. Also, iterating over uh, over over keys in Rockets dictionary. So we again don't have to use the keys function uh, to iterate over 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 dictionaries. We just well use the for in statement. And then it will just print it. Uh, it's also a nicer way to print it in separate lines. So we have this this print statement here. So it's highly recommended if you if you're having a big code and you don't know what's going on, you can print print each dictionary line by line. Uh, there is a very useful uh, structure in Python. That is not actually in basic Python, it's in the collections uh, module called default dictionary, default dict. And uh, it kind of does this check whether the key is in the in the in the dictionary for us. And if it's not, then it initializes it to some default value. Uh, in this case, I'm providing a type of the values of the dictionary. So this will take the type. Of values in the dictionary. This can be anything. It can be uh, a tuple, uh, a list, an int. Uh, it's usually an int or an lit or a list. It can be even a dictionary. Uh, so a dictionary, a dictionary. It's kind of a, a 2D dictionary. Uh, but mostly people use it for for int, so they don't have to really check whether an element is in in the dictionary. Um, so let's say I'm not doing this assignment to nine here, and I didn't set the key uh, of the of the one. Uh, it should automatically pr print zero. So this default value for this default dict is zero. Okay. But now I can update it. Let's say I'll increment it by one. And I'll get the one because it it was initialized uh, with a zero. OK, this is a bit a bit of information. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate. Uh, these are very important structures in Python, probably the most useful for 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 many, many uses. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about the first question. So we want to define a function which returns. Uh, the OK, the first letter in the string that only appears once. So let's say we have a string. Uh, the commas are not really necessary. But let's say we have a string given like this. And we want to return the first letter that appears only once in the in the in the string. In this case it would be letter D because it only appears once here. Uh, but also remember that y appears once, but it's not returned by our function uh, because uh, it's not the first letter to appear there. Appear there. If you have any ideas, then go ahead. 
I'll give you a minute for this one. Okay, uh, let me start defining the function. So first, uh, single. And we take a string, s, let's say. And we start, uh, first of all, we want a dictionary. Let's call it the d, and it will be initially an empty dictionary. And now uh, we iterate for the string, uh, let's say for a in S. Uh, and now we're checking if A is in uh, in the dictionary. If it is, then we, we want to do D of A plus equals one. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, we don't want to do it. We want to append because we'll be keeping the list of indices. Uh, or actually, there, there is a different solution. Sorry. Uh, if it's already in the dictionary, then we already have its first appearance. So uh, we rather not keep a list. We'll just keep its first appearance. So in this example, uh, we'll have a dictionary where I'll comment here and show you what I mean. So we'll have a dictionary which will keep, which will have a character as a key. A character as a key. And then uh, its first occurrence as a value. So in this case, it will be a zero. Then it will be, uh, let's say, B one uh, then uh, D will be uh, one, two, three, four. So the third one right. Yeah. And if we, for example, come, if we, for example, see the, the, the string we already have in the dictionary, again, we can set it to some uh, minus one value. So it, uh, init so it checks that, uh, so it tells us that, well, it appears twice, so it's an invalid character. So maybe let's, pick, let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. So we do for i in s or a in s. We'll be going for the for the length of the of the string uh, because we'll be recording the indices, right? So if uh, let's say s of a is in the dictionary then we should set uh, this s of a value to minus one because we already seen it so it doesn't appear once therefore it appears one, more than once so it's it's an invalid possible result otherwise else we will want to do uh, s of a and the current index which we're which we're at so this will give us a, a dictionary, which I was talking about over here, like this. And now we want to iterate over the dictionary. So we do for, uh, let's say, key, 
in uh, D, uh, we'll want to keep the track of the result uh, and the, the minimum index, right? So uh, mean min index. We have to set it to some value that we know that it's it kind of uh, is safe for us to assume. So if I say that uh, at initially minimal index will be equal to the length of the string, then surely there is some character that it's before the end of the string uh, that appears once. And if it's not the case, uh, then I'll I'll have an invalid uh, invalid input. And the result we're currently not concerned about. Or we can give it some dummy value as uh, as a star, which will tell us that oh no, this string doesn't have a character that appears once, so we'll return a star because that's what we think we should do. Uh, you can also throw an error or uh, well make an assertion. Okay. And now we want to see if, uh, let's say, D of key is less than uh, the minimum index. And if it is, we should uh, update our minimum index, but also uh, make the result equal uh, to the to D of key, because that's the character we're searching for. So it will be uh, uh, D of key, and the result will be just a key. And this keep track keeps track of the of the of the minimum. Okay, and at the end we should return rest, and hope 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 that it does work. Uh, let's say first single, uh, and we need the string, so we call s equal to this thing. Okay, what's wrong? You need a range in front of yeah, your yeah, word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. I make that mistake all the time. Yeah. <laughs> quite common isn't it something what's wrong uh min id is not defined oh min end okay wow that's wrong why mm, okay so we have we have our first issue of debugging so real life coding uh let's maybe print the dictionary to see if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's all right. Okay, yeah, you remember we we set it to a dummy value minus one, but now we're not really checking uh, whether it's this invalid value. So uh, we should also check uh, that d of key is actually greater than minus one, or not equal to minus one because otherwise we'll automatically get the, the first invalid character. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this, this looks nicer. So uh, as expected, the D was the first uh, single appearing character. And then there was a Y, but we didn't concern ourselves with Y because Y is the second, second single appearing character. So, uh, we just choose D. Uh, remember to remove the debugging print statements uh, because they are kind of production code, not really meant to be uh, released. Okay, so we have our first single function defined. Great. Now, let's make a second exercise. Uh, I'll give you maybe like 40 seconds, a minute to, to think about how could you solve it with a dictionary. Uh, so we are given a list of numbers and the number K, and we have to see if any two numbers in this list uh, add up to K. 
consider how to make it uh, a bit more, we say, efficient, so faster. Yeah, I'll give you 40 seconds. Also, if there are any questions, uh, chat is there. OK, uh, so let's start maybe about thinking uh, a bit about this function. Uh, this is what often happens with like coding interviews. So maybe uh, maybe if you want to make something faster that we think about uh, improving our solution. So first, uh, I'll reason about something called the brute force. A brute force solution is a solution that uh, kind of we know that it works, but we also know that it's horrible because it's uh, there's a lot of repetition or some sort of uh, slowing down. Uh, so my idea for for a brute force solution here would be to consider any two numbers in the list, any two numbers in the list, and um, well, C. If, uh, if 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 they sum up to to the number k which we are given, uh, if you think about it in terms of the number of elements in the list, uh, we'll have to consider each pair, which turns out to be be a a quadratic uh, in terms of this this length. If we call the length n, it will be a quadratic solution. And now, um, well, this is an inefficient version, but we know that if we consider every possible pair, then surely uh, we will consider all the possibilities. Uh, let's think about about something more cleverer so by using a dictionary. So. Uh, um, up k, and we are given a list of numbers and the number k, and we'll be checking if any of the two elements sum up to the number of k. Uh, remember to not not to make a mistake of uh, let's say checking the same number twice. So uh, what I'll propose in our dictionary is that um, we keep track of of the index of the index at which a particular number appears so let's define a dictionary and now we'll be going through the uh, through the list and if i is in d so if the element or is already contained in the dictionary uh, then uh, we do check um, then we do append it to the to the list. So our dictionary will keep the value and the list of indices at which this value appears. So if you have a if you have a list of uh, let's say one, one, two, three, three, two, and our dictionary will be one appears at zero, a single a singleton list, then our uh, Two appears at uh, one and uh, two, three, and four, and then uh, three appears at uh, two and three. Okay. And now we'll be appending to the list 
the index. Otherwise, if the element is not already in the list, then we do uh, D of I. Uh, yeah, sorry, we'll be going through the range length. Constantly. Forget it. Yeah, we're going through the indices of the list. And uh, then we'll be checking the element at the particular index of the list. Short fix. Yeah. So we're checking elements of the, at the at the particular index of the list and seeing if, if they're already contained in the dictionary. And uh, if it isn't, then we make a singleton list with, with the element. OK, so now we can think about that. We, we scan through the list like uh, once. So if the length of the list was n, then we did like n operations. Uh, second thing which we which we have to do is now actually see if if they sum up. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see. We'll be iterating through the list again, but now we'll be checking something different. So let's say uh, now we'll be checking whether the element is. Uh, if the k minus the element which we're currently considering is in the dictionary. So let's make a variable current and it will be uh, well d of l of sorry, it will be l of i. So we're considering the element of the at the if element, right? But what we're searching for is k minus this element. Because if two elements in the list sum up to k, then if we rearrange this equation, we're just getting, uh, well, k minus l equals to some other, other element in the list uh, that, that should sum up to it. OK, so if this current uh, in dict in d, uh, then we're almost happy, but we have to remember to not to take the same element uh, twice, which is an, an interesting edge case. So um, now we will have to consider if if the k is even or odd, because if it happens that we, that k was say four, right? and we didn't have a two here, we would just have one two. So it would appear once in the list. Then we would see that two is in the list and then current would be also two. But we can't use the same number twice. So this is invalid. So we have to make sure that we're keeping track of it. Uh, OK, so we're checking that current is in the dictionary. Cool. Uh, now we have to check, well, whether current uh, is divisible by 2. And uh, oh, sorry, whether k is divisible by 2. Right. And now. Uh, and now also check if, if current is equal to k divided by 2 with the whole number division. OK, so we're checking whether current is equal to the half of k. And uh, last thing we'll be checking if the list of indices, uh, given the current, is, has length greater than 1, because we don't want to check the element twice. Uh, I'll be back in a second, sorry. Yep, I'm back. Sure. So we're checking whether it's even, checking whether it's a half, and now we have to check whether the length of the uh, current is greater than, than one. This is the special case we're checking for. Uh, and if it is, cool.
Cool. We have a mat. We have a match. Return true. Big true. Small true. Big true. Okay. Okay. This is the special case in in case current is equal to k divided by two, right? Uh, if it isn't. If it isn't, then we will be checking uh, whether current, right? Uh, whether current. So now we know that one of those conditions failed, right? So either K uh, is not even, uh, or current was not equal to the half, or the length wasn't really that. Okay, so to make sure, we'll do uh, that uh, current is not equal to the k divided by half. Or actually, do we want to do it this way? You can see that it gets a bit confusing if we, if we have this special case. Uh, let's ignore it for a while. So now we're just checking uh, whether uh, well, L of I. Yeah, that's the, that's it. We have to return true in the other case in which they're not equal. Oh, I get a bit convoluted here. And the case in if it, in which it does work is that uh, current is in the dictionary. Oh yeah, that is why. Sorry. So uh, we're iterating through the dictionary. That went a bit convoluted, but we're iterating through the dictionary. And now we'll be subtracting I. And we'll be checking if current is, is in the dictionary. Okay, cool. So if current is in the dictionary, and I is in the dictionary, that then means that they both are in the dictionary. So we can return true. Uh, so we have to make sure that uh, current is not divisible by two, I think. Might be wrong over here, but let's see if it, if it works. And if it doesn't work, then we'll return false. And now let's see if it if it works. For example, for uh, our example case, in which we do sum up to k. Of this list. And four. Okay, one space here. Okay. work l if there are a couple of errors here but we'll figure it out Yep, we have to access the element at the particular index. Cool. Okay, they sum up. Uh, let's say we have, uh, we don't have a three, we just have a five. Okay. Okay. Current is right. Yep. We we'll need here bracket. Okay. So they don't sum up. In case it's three, they do sum up. Uh, let's see if this case works. That's true. What if it's not? Uh, one. False. 
OK, so it looks like our function works. And now we can think about the complexity of it. Sorry for that. OK, so we can think about the complexity of it. So uh, we were scanning for the string here once. Uh, so we had to go through the whole string and then we're just going through the dictionary. Uh, which in worst case has the same number of keys as as the number of strings as the number of of numbers in the in the in the dictionary and as we're as we're going for the dictionary uh, if all numbers were unique then in, in the worst case it would be well the length the length of the string so this is a linear solution so with the help of of this dictionary we're able to uh, well, make it linear, which means it's the number of elements in the list, not the, not quadratic in this sense. Okay. I leave this one for homework. So we are given two strings and uh, we have to determine if they are isomorphic, which means that uh, we can basically swap letters and it will be the same word, but the the way we swap letters should be uh, constant. So uh, in this case, we can see that add is isomorphic to egg because we're swapping e to a and then g to d. But if it would be, let's say, uh, e esg, then we couldn't do the swap because, uh, well, s maps to the same letter as G, which which can't happen because that that's the that's the property of isomorphisms in this sense. Give it a shot uh, at home. All right. Uh, are there any questions about the dictionaries? This is what a, the second exercise was a bit was a bit confusing, so I I'm happy to take. Uh, any questions? Okay. If not, then uh, we shall proceed. Okay. Uh, I would like to come back to the control flow a little bit. So if and else and elif. Um, we were using the break statement already. But in case you don't remember, uh, the break statement is, is used in the loops, in for loops or while loops, and it basically terminates the loop a bit earlier. So let's say uh, we have some critical condition in our code, uh, like, I don't know, we're measuring the temperature of a particular substance, and if it goes above 100 degrees, then we want to panic and uh, turn off the alarm turn on the alarm, then we would call a break statement and print an error that, wow, uh, we're checking the temperature constantly and now suddenly it's 100. Uh, pass statement does nothing. Uh, it's more informational and or if you don't want to put anything in an if statement. So if we have a condition at which we don't want to do anything, uh, then we would use uh, a pass statement. And third one is continue. Continue just jumps to the end of the loop and uh, proceeds with the loop again. So let's say we have a particular condition at which uh, we don't want to do all the steps. Uh, let's say we have some maximal temperature of, of a substance and uh, we don't want to increase it. So we just do a continue and then we'll measure temperature again. Maybe it will go lower, so it will hit, we will heat it up. Uh, Again. Cool. Let's go to the workspace. All right. So let's say we want to uh, count to uh, 30. So we can do it with a for loop. We can do it with, with a clever uh, while loop. But we can also do it with a break statement. So we're making a while true loop. 
this loop will would go on forever without a break statement. But as we have a as we have a break statement, if the counter goes above 29, which means it's 30, then we will break. So we will get out of this loop. Okay. Pass statement does nothing. Let's say we want to uh, multiply by. Uh, let's say we want to multiply the uh, the the even numbers by four and keep the the the, the odd numbers the same. Uh, then a pass statement would just denote that we are not doing anything with with the odd numbers. But it still proceeds to to the lot parts of the loop, especially the print statement here. And here is the continue statement. So as you, as you can see, this will ignore uh, odd elements. So it will not consider the print statement uh, for e for odd elements because uh, that's the way continue works. It will just go back up to the loop. Yeah, this is an example from a very useful site, Geeks for Geeks. If you ever have algorithmic problems, probably refer to this one as well. And uh, this is the difference between the, the past statement and the continue statement, which is kind of a key. Uh, so in this case, we're reaching this print statement, right, for the letter K. So it prints geeks and pass executed, right? And in this case, it won't print the letter K here after continue executed because it will jump to the loop again. OK. Uh, there is one short exercise. I'll give you guys a minute to. To have a look at it. And then I'll. I'll proceed with coding. So we are giving uh, we're giving a water level and a critical level. And uh, we want to print one or minus one, whether the level was going up or down compared to the previous. To the previous uh, level. And um, if it goes above the critical level, we just want to exit the loop and print flood. OK, let me start coding it up. So we will be going, let's not define a function now. Let's just keep it simple. So for uh, WL in water level, uh, we'll also want to have a variable for the previous level. So let's call it previous. And uh, it will be water level of mm. Let's say water level of zero. We'll be going through the length. Of the water level range length. And now the special cases in which uh, we're at the zero index, which we don't want to consider. So we can start from one. All right. And now, uh, if previous is equal to uh, uh, water level of WL, then nothing happens. So we shouldn't print anything, right? Uh, so this is a place for 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 a continuous statement. Okay. 
can be also a pass statement. Uh, but continue fits here quite well. LF uh, previous is less than the water level of WL. Then we'll uh, print minus one. No, sorry, uh, one because it increased. Uh, and the last case, which is uh, basically else, because we're consider all other ways that these things can differ, we'll just print minus one. But remember about our critical level. So uh, let's define the critical level. To be four, for example, and now we have to do an additional check whether we're above our critical level. So uh, if uh, this one greater than the critical level, then we just want to uh, print flood. And terminate. Which is the break statement. Okay, let's maybe check uh, with decreasing one. Okay, we have a, all right. We also have to update the previous uh, variable. We'll actually do it at all times. So uh, it shouldn't be in the LF, it should be on this level. Does this work? Pref. So as we can see, initially it was zero, then it went to one, then nothing changed, then it went to two, then it went down, and then it got uh, got into four, which is uh, above the critical level. Uh, then it got to four, and then it got to five. Five is above the critical level, so it dies. Okay. Any questions? Cool. One last thing before we get into print state, into uh, printing graphs, uh, which are lambdas. Uh, lambdas are, uh, so if we want to define a really small function uh, in one line, so like adding two to something or taking the first element of the tuple, uh, we can use something called lambdas, and these are uh, these short functions that that just don't that you don't have to do the define statement, uh, put it in different lines. It's such a short anonymous function. They don't usually have a name, but we can assign variables to it. So uh, in this example, we use the the keyword lambda, uh, and then we define the arguments which this function would take. Uh, in this case, we're just multiplying by 10. And then we'll print f of, of, of 10. In this case, g, uh, g takes uh, two arguments, and the arguments can also be functions. Uh, so it will be basically applying the, the function d to a and then adding 10, which will give us uh, 110. Cool. Uh, the main thing we're using it for is sorting, which is uh, which is sorting. So uh, we we have a key argument in sort function. This is kind of important if you want to sort by some some different function than just numerical order. Uh, in sorting. Uh, so in this example, I am sorting by using the lambda on the sum of the two elements in the tuple. 
and then I'm just printing the sorted list. Okay. Uh, I'll just make the the first the first one in the exercise, so it's quite fast. Uh, so it will be f equals lambda of x colon x plus seven. Yep. And maybe the 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 third example is uh, let's say h equals to Lambda um, x and t, where uh, four plus d of x. Oh. And for example, we want f of um, I would say h of uh, one plus one, and the second argument will be f. Right. So in this case, we're adding four, and then we're applying f, which is one plus seven, which is four plus twelve. Cool. And if we want to do the sorting. Then we're just doing uh, two pulls sort, two pulls sort, uh, and we define the key argument here. And the way key argument here will be defined as lambda. And we'll be taking uh, a tuple, so a t, and now we'll be we'll want to sort in a non-increasing order of tuples. Uh, so to sort with a non-increasing order, we might just negate the, the actual parameter because uh, otherwise we'll sort in the increasing order and uh, we take the second element of the tuple. And let's, let us print tuples. Oh. OK. So yeah. We're decreasing with the second argument of the tuple. All right. So this is uh, these are the the Python features, and now we're getting into plotting things in in Python. Are there any any questions so far for for the features that are here? Nope. OK. Then let's have a bit of fun with with plotting. So first thing we, we have to import is matplotlib.pyplot and usually people call it PLT. Right? On my chem degree, they just told you to write percentage pylab space inline. And that just imports all of the uh, all of the functions in the module. Okay, uh, you can do you it. You should as well. try it. See what happens. Okay. What, Percent. What, do you want to type it on the chat? Oh yeah, I'll type on the chat. Yeah. Let me just find the chat. <laughs> I don't know how to use Microsoft Teams. Okay. Sure. Uh, was it import and then percentage sign, right? No, it was just percent sign. No, no import. Just just percent pi lab, p y l a b, and then space, yeah. and then inline l i uh, i n l i n e. R I N L I N E, yeah, yeah, and then just run that and it should say populating. Yeah. What? <laughs> Matplotlib yeah. prevents importing PyLab and NumPy. Well, look, it would work if you didn't already import NumPy. <laughs> we, we can try it. 
Uh, sure. It works. Uh, I would stick to, yeah, well, uh, good catch. Uh, you can use it as well. Uh, but now we're using just the plotting features, so I guess I would stick to the pie plot. Uh, but sure, there, there is a pile up feature as well. I'll keep it commented here and cool. Yeah, and we'll also be using the NumPy, which is kind of for arrays and vectors. Uh, it's not key to know it uh, for this lecture. So first of all, um, there is a plt.plot function in the matplotlib, uh, and we're, we're, we'll be concerned with the first three arguments. So uh, we have the x-axis data, y-axis data, and it will print the, the plot for for those align and format uh, is the third argument which specifies how it will be formatted. Uh, there will be an example in a, in a minute. Mm, there are also scatter plots which are which do not draw continuous lines but rather points. And there are finally histograms uh, that you can well draw with it, with, with with the data well the frequency of those. Okay. There is also there are also some decoration functions. So uh, you can add a legend to a to a to a to a graph. You can add a grid. Uh, you can add a text. So like font size, style, weight, and color. You can add a title for a graph. Uh, X label, also a Y label, which is not included here. And uh, the limits. The limits. Oh, it's it's here. Y label is here. Uh, well, x limits. So kind of to maybe align our data the way the way we want them to be aligned. And this is the final function we call after we do all this preparation with our graph, which is plt show that actually shows the graph. Uh, it is best understood with an example. So uh, first of all, we do. Uh, NP lin space. This is just a linear space, uh, so uh, it creates 50 values from uh, from zero to two pi. Uh, so, yeah, it's just a vector of 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 zero from two pi and 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 kind of divided into 50. Uh, y1 will be will be this linear space uh, with applied sine function, and y2 will be the same space, but but shifted by pi over two. I guess you guys are quite okay with with this with the trigonometric functions. Uh, okay, yeah. There is also a uh, we want to set the figure size, so we use the PLT figure and set set the relative size of the of the graph. Yeah, and then we then we set the actual uh, values. So we take the, the x's, set the y's, and uh, give them labels. So this will be sine, this will be sine plus two pi, and uh, colors, line width, whichever you like. Uh, every, every single of those functions can be found in the matplotlib uh, documentation if you're more interested going more into depth. Yeah, and uh, y3 will be cosine, so we'll be plotting three graphs at one in one, let's say, uh, plane. And this will be a scatter. And finally, we're using uh, the decoration functions. So first of all, we're making a title, then some legend, X label, Y label, which pretty intuitively will be called X and Y now. Uh, we specify if we want a grid and well, Y limit, and we call graph show. If you wouldn't like to have a grid, then we can do a false here. No grid. Uh, also. Uh, Let's say we want to say that y is actually a trig value. Yep, so it changes this one. Uh, 
let's call it an argument. Cool. Um, well, there is. So, uh, for example, here with this uh, dash dash, we're specifying that y2 should be kind of this dashed line. All of those arguments can 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 be found in the matplotlib documentation if if you want to make make your graph as beautiful as possible. Uh, but the the key things which we have to have is that we uh, do plt plot and then x and y's, uh, which can be np uh, numpy uh, vectors or they can be regular Python lists. I usually do it with with regular Python lists. Okay. Maybe another example with a histogram. So we're we're making a distribution of a thousand random numbers. So numpy random random numbers. Uh, we're setting the figure size, and then we're uh, then we're taking the uh, the data, uh, defining the number of uh, of of bins, which is the number of of columns. In the histogram, and some some well stylistic uh, stylistic features. Uh, so this data is uh, well a thousand random numbers. Uh, so we see that this distribution is well close to the to the Gaussian distribution. If you go for well. Let's say more more numbers and maybe more bins. Then we can see that it's a bit more uh, like Gaussian, Gaussian distribution. Yep. Random can also specify the range. Uh, which can also be found in the documentation. OK. And the final final feature is uh, 3D plots in, in matplotlib. So uh, we also have to import uh, MPL toolkits and plot 3D uh, to do the 3D sketches. So uh, that's that's required. We set the figure size as at the beginning. Uh, we're adding a subplot, uh, which is a technicality, but uh, we have to kind of, uh, we have a figure and then we have to put on it the subplot, which it will be the 3D uh, object. Uh, so this is just required for the for the sake of 3D. Then we're again defining the, the linear spaces where uh, we're looking for. And uh, well, we're plotting plotting the the lines and the scatter data. This one with a star, and this one with 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 a K color. Yeah, setting labels, and finally showing. Uh, we can, for example, try tan, and you can see that it prints the, the ta tangent sine h probably be interesting maybe cosine age right these are these are the options for for a 3d plot uh if you guys are interested a bit more about uh printing uh i made this tutorial for the for the f sciences i i can't uh, emphasize it more than to just have a look at it uh, because it has some good resources for the for the printing. So you can turn on live coding, and here you have basically a similar material we did, but with some extensions like uh, colorful meshes and animations, even like these ones. Okay. Any questions regarding the matplotlib? It's a very big library. Uh, the way people usually work with with Python plotting is that they just refer to the uh, to the 
documentation while they when they need a graph actually and they will just read through the functions that they find useful for their particular plot um do you know the difference between the matplotlib library and the matplotlib.pyplot plot library because if you just import matplotlib you can't do plots oh i would expect that you that you can do uh plots without matplotlib we can we can check no i mean maybe You're you sure? can but i've i've tried on spider and it just doesn't work module has module object not well that's not the error okay. i get is just matplotlib has no attribute plot or has no function plot all right uh, I was having a lot of trouble with that actually because um, yeah I was trying to plot stuff in Spider and I was trying to just import matplotlib as plot and it wasn't working but thank you you fixed that for me so oh yeah okay so I guess now 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 we know that we have to do the pi plot uh, I didn't go that that deep into matplotlib but uh, I guess maybe pl pi plot module uh, specifies some functions for calling. Uh, and yeah, so I guess that pyplot defines something that matplotlib doesn't define, and therefore uh, it's the way it is. Uh, I can send you the filled-in workspace, uh, William, and yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send you the link now on the chat. That would uh, I actually can't access the chat. Really. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why. Okay. Uh, can you just email me? I mean, uh, okay. I know you, Angelo, so <laughs> anyway. Uh, in case, yeah, it's it's there for you, William. Uh, the idea is, is to fill in the workspaces uh, on your own, but this course is very, very based uh, on, on this website. Uh, that I did during the summer. So uh, please have a look there as well. Uh, does it your does it answer your questions, William? Cool. All right. Uh, let me go to the presentation. Not this one. Okay. Yeah, and that's it for today. Uh, next lecture will be a bit more computer science-y. So we'll look into object-oriented programming, which is very uh, useful in simulations. So like uh, defining organisms and things like that. Uh, so if you, if you want to join, it would be great. And also a bit about algorithms, uh, especially how to make things more efficient. We had the flavor of it with today, analyzing the brute force and the efficient solution. We'll dig a, dip, a, deep, a, a bit deeper into it uh, next time. Okay, uh, if there are any questions, I, I, can, I can be here for a couple of minutes. So do not hesitate to reach me out. And yeah, I see you guys next week. And thank you for attending this session. And yeah, thanks, thanks Noah for recording. Uh, okay. I guess we can stop recording now and uh, yeah, thank you guys.